The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, hello everyone. Hello and welcome. This is exam preparation session and we are going to talk today about AWS Certified Developer Associate exam. Um, kind of check uh, before we will start. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see my slide? Is everything is fine uh, with the sound? No interruptions, no background noises. Uh, could you please type something in the questions panel to notify that everything is fine? And uh, uh, we'll kick off with that. Okay, at least Stefan can hear me. Everything is fine. All right. So, um, again, welcome. Uh, welcome. And uh, let me, uh, first of all, uh, let me first of all introduce uh, myself and our today team. So, my name is Alexander Shapoval. Uh, I'm... Uh, AWS technical instructor. I've been working in AWS since uh, March 2020, so three years and a bit more. Um, before AWS, I spent a lot of time, uh, more than 16 years, working in Microsoft, uh, uh, focusing on different areas. Uh, and two uh, last years uh, of my journey in Microsoft, uh, I helped customer to implement some DevOps practices in the cloud. Um, I'm based in Munich uh, in Germany and today I'm not alone, fortunately. Uh, uh, so Stefan, uh, my colleagues from um, training and certification department uh, will help me uh, and support uh, uh, me by answering your questions in the panel. Uh, so Stefan, if you would like to say something about yourself, it's a great time to do so. Good morning, Alex. Good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to be here and looking forward to a great session for exam prep. Uh, not much else, really. I'm a colleague of Alex's, um, and actually we've uh, we've collaborated a bit together in the beginning when I've just started a few months ago. I think Alex uh, uh, remembers and uh, been really great. I'm glad to do it again as well. So thank you very much and uh, hope you have a fantastic day today. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you, Stefan. Um, okay, uh, let's move on. And first of all, uh, let's discuss some uh, logistic stuff, some housekeeping stuff. You see um, um, FAQ, frequently asked uh, questions. So let me go through those questions quickly. So first of all, uh, what about our interaction? So at any time, uh, you can type uh, any of your questions in the questions panel obviously not in the chat i'd like to mention that because chat uh, is available uh, in a read only mode for you uh, but in the questions panel at any time just type your questions and uh, stefan will help me to um, answer those questions and maybe uh, periodically i will check this panel as well uh, so what about slides uh, unfortunately we are not going to distribute any slides uh, during or even after this webinar. However, uh, you can find uh, the similar content in a digital format, uh, which is available on demand on our Skill Builders portal, and probably will provide with the link uh, to this content later on. Uh, I'd like to mention right now that uh, Skills Builder portal uh, under maintenance right now. So if you will try to open this resource, um, especially if you're familiar with this resource, you will see appropriate message, but uh, probably uh, it will be not for the for so long time. Uh, and later on, you can easily access content uh, like this. So what about recording uh, of this event? Uh, probably you can see that uh, it's been recording uh, recorded right now. 
but again, uh, we must do this uh, recording uh, for the uh, internal quality assurance purpose only. So we're not going to distribute any records here. And again, uh, you will be able to uh, check uh, similar, very similar content uh, on Skill Builder port portal later on. Uh, and yes, we are going to provide some additional links uh, throughout this session. Uh, so uh, you will be uh, equipped uh, accordingly to be prepared for uh, this exam. Uh, that's the main stuff. Um, now what about uh, agenda and schedule? Uh, for today what we're going to do so that's our main topic uh, certified developer associate uh, so we'll talk about some content that can help you uh, to be prepared and successfully pass uh, this exam uh, this session uh, in particular uh, has duration around uh, three hours so our, our official time zone is uh, UK time or UTC plus one so uh, we are going to end up around noon right something like that maybe early maybe a bit later <laughs> depending on uh, um, how much i'm going to talk and i'm going to talk a lot today right so uh, three hour sessions uh, session and uh, um, probably i will set up uh, two short breaks uh 10 minutes um almost every hour so probably two breaks we will have. Uh, uh, that's about our schedule uh, for today. Okay. Um, what else? Uh, now about agenda. Um, we are going to, to go through uh, four different uh, um, technical domains, right? Uh, development with AWS services, security, deployment, troubleshooting, and optimization. And those four domains are exactly the same domains that will be covered during the real exam. Uh, and uh, to find more details uh, about this exam uh, and to find more resources uh, that you can use in order to uh, prepare yourself uh, for this exam, uh, let me demonstrate uh, our main page, uh, not this one, uh, put this um, aws.amazon.com slash training that's where you can find all uh, information from training and certification department uh, in AWS uh, and specifically if you're interested in um, any certification programs just click here get certified uh, click certification overview. That's the uh, landing page with information about all certification exams uh, and programs that we have. And if I scroll down here, uh, you see all our certifications. And today we are, uh, we are focusing on developer associate. So if you click on this icon, that's the page um, about this exam and you can get more detailed information here. Specifically, you see that the current uh, duration of this exam um, it's a bit more than two hours, uh, 130 minutes. You see the current cost. Uh, and that's the uh, test with uh, 65 different questions. Uh, and also on this page, uh, you can find two uh, quite interesting and important documents. The first one, uh, exam guide. Let me open this document uh, on the screen right now uh, and zoom it uh, a little bit. Um, if you uh, go through this document, uh, you will see a detailed description of those four domains that we are going to cover today, right? So uh, with some uh, information, uh, what knowledge uh, you expect it to have, uh, what skills you need to demonstrate during the exam, uh, and so on and so forth quite interesting and useful document. Uh, you can use it as, as a reference. And another uh, document uh, that I'd like to emphasize here, uh, sample questions, uh, which is quite short with just uh, uh, 10 questions. Uh, and those questions are similar to what you will see uh, in a real exam, not the same, but <laughs> similar to. Uh, and it's a, a you know, nice opportunity to um, you know, check your readiness uh, and maybe uh, identify uh, your gaps. So, and moreover, uh, on the same page, if I scroll down, you can find a lot of additional information um, like uh, sample questions, uh, 
you've already seen this document, document practice questions set uh, and some um, additional set of uh, useful resources. Uh, again, uh, some of them uh, point you to the skill builder which is under maintenance right now, but it will be available soon. All right, um, let me switch back to my presentation and uh, um, uh, let's go on. And first of all, um, uh, maybe let me uh, set up your expectations uh, a little bit. You see on this slide our main goals of the session. I'm not going to um, learn you how to write a uh, code or uh, we are not going to talk about all required aspects to successfully pass this exam. We are assuming that you've already know that. Uh, what, we are, uh, what we are going to do during the next few hours, uh, we will talk uh, about those four domains uh, and I try to uh, emphasize the most important uh, points, most important services that uh, you need to know. Uh, and this information uh, helps you to um, identify some gaps maybe in your knowledge to uh, clearly understand, okay, I, I need to uh, get more details uh, about this service or this service and uh, be uh, even better prepared for the exam, right? And we will talk about some uh, key takeaways, uh, key points uh, related to different services here. That's my, uh, that's our idea and uh, uh, of course this short se session uh, is not going to substitute um, some of our official courses like developing on AWS which is three day uh, course. No, uh, we expecting that you are familiar uh, with the content, uh, with some services, but uh, let's do kind of technical uh, review of such knowledge. So, um, those four domain, uh, domains here and the first one, uh, development with uh, AWS services. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit uh, about this domain. And if you open uh, exam guide, uh, I've already mentioned previously um, in my <laughs> short demo, uh, if you want, you will see that inside this domain, we have uh, three different you know, tasks. Um, that's what you need to know. That's what you need to be able to do. Uh, so you should be able to develop code for applications hosted on AWS. Uh, you see that the second task here, develop code for the Lambda. Lambda is a very important focus uh, of uh, developer associate exam. Uh, you need to, to be able to choose the most appropriate uh, storage option uh, for the application that you're designing. So uh, we'll go through all those three uh, tasks and the first one, uh, develop code for applications hosted on AWS. Um, so this first technical domain, probably uh, the most broad uh, demand, uh, domain and uh, you will get uh, you know, a lot of questions during the exam related uh, to, this, to this topic. All right, and probably you've already known that uh, in order to design uh, AWS solution, uh, you can use Well Architected Framework. Well Architected Framework can be considered as a set of uh, main design principles and also best practices um, collected by uh, AWS and uh, order it appropriately. And uh, those design principles and uh, uh, security be uh, and best practices are, are split across uh, six different areas or uh, six different pillars. You see them on the screen uh, and at any time you can open aws.amazon.com uh, website and you can find uh, those design principles. Um, when we talk about building uh, applications, uh, building applications, building um, software for the AWS, um, one of the important uh, area uh, in the well-architected framework for you is this one, operation excellence. Of course, not only, but uh, many uh, stuff that we're going to discuss today are related to the operational excellence. All right, uh, let's move on. Uh, so first of all, uh, you have to understand um, how to use uh, different uh, um, architectural patterns when you design your application. And one of the important uh, approach here, uh, event-driven architecture. Uh, why this one? Well, first of all, because um, 
event-driven architecture fits perfectly uh, to AWS. Inside AWS, we have a lot of 200 plus actually uh, right now, different services, and those services generate different events and talk to each other. So that's why event-driven design uh, is the natural approach to design your application. Um, and of course, as a part of um, such design, you can use microservices architectural pattern. And you see on the screen a couple of questions that um, you can ask yourself um, before you will get started uh, building some solution. So what about um, um, your application and how it will be accessed, right? Uh, so what about usage pattern? Uh, can you understand that in advance? Can you do some estimations here? So what about underlying infrastructure? infrastructure. I wouldn't say the hardware because in AWS you don't have direct access uh, to the hardware typically, but what about underlying infrastructure? Uh, are we talking about designing application that will be host on uh, EC2 instances or uh, as a set of containers or as a set of serverless technologies uh, like Lambda? Uh, so uh, are we going to use uh, API driven approach or uh, something else? So um, uh, such couple of questions can help you to choose the most appropriate solution uh, based on uh, business goals that you have as a software engineer uh, to design your uh, application. So uh, what we need to uh, understand here, uh, every time when you design uh, event-driven uh, architecture, and uh, uh, microservices pattern can be one of the uh, way uh, to build such application. We need to understand kind of benefits and trade-offs, right? So uh, what we can uh, identify as a benefits of uh, uh, event-driven approach. So first of all, uh, by leveraging different microservices, and again, we can implement them differently as a Docker containers, as a Lambda function. Uh, so we can achieve the greater uh, scalability. So at any time, we can scale different parts of our solution by adding uh, new instances of our microservices. We can achieve um, greater um, resiliency this way. We can reduce the uh, development, uh, software development life cycle. Because uh, for each microservice, we can set up the separate uh, life cycle and we can deploy, scale and update uh, each of those microservices independently, so more or less independently. Um, what else? Uh, we can use different technology stacks uh, for each of those microservices. Um, uh, and we can continue this discussion, but we can also uh, should understand uh, some trade-offs uh, of using uh, such approach. And first of all, complexity. Uh, the more and more microservices you will use inside your applications, the more and more effort uh, you should uh, spend in order to um, set up required environment in order to make sure that uh, each microservice can uh, detect and talk to uh, another one uh, in a more efficient way. And uh, um, the latency. This is another trade-off of uh, such pattern because uh, uh, in monolith application, uh, all uh, tightly coupled components can talk to each other because very often they host it on the same uh, physical or virtual host. That's not the case typically when we uh, when we are talking about um, a cloud native application. So we need to take into account some uh, network latency. Uh, and uh, um, another interesting aspect, what about uh, component failure? What if uh, uh, the microservice failed uh, for some reasons or what if uh, the AWS service that, um, you know, stopped, uh, stopped responding uh, to our solution? So um, we can uh, use a loosely coupled approach. Uh, to handle such failure, uh, and we can uh, incorporate such uh, services like uh, SQS, simple uh, queue service, or SNS, simple unification service, or uh, event breach, uh, right? Uh, and that's uh, the way to uh, continue to handle our customers within application, um, uh, even in case when there's some part of some uh, microservice within this application fail for some reason. So moving forward, um, we uh, we have to understand how can we uh, orchestrate uh, those microservices within our application. So we can leverage uh, kind of standard patterns uh, to organize the orchestration. Uh, one of the um, 
most uh, well-known approach here, especially when we talk about serverless solution, but not only, uh, is um, Amazon Step Function. So the step function uh, you can use to uh, realize the workflow and inside this workflow uh, you can use a um, broad set of different uh, uh, AWS services. Lambda is a great ex example. That's how we can uh, implement uh, orchestration uh, for different Lambda functions. We can run some of them in parallel sequentially. We can implement the um, if else logic here etc uh, but keep in mind that step function can be used nowadays not only for the serverless services we can uh, create uh, um, workflow uh, and incorporate many different solutions uh, in the cloud um, like analytics solution compute different compute resources different storage options uh, so it's not just about uh, serverless another pattern that you see on the screen uh, fan out uh, how can you implement uh, the requirements when uh, one microservice uh, should send uh, information that must be consumed by uh, many different components uh, and many different services maybe uh, in AWS? Uh, again, one of the approach here, uh, SNS. We can organize based on SNS different topics. Uh, and uh, uh, this publisher-subscriber model can help us to send message to the topic and uh, uh, all subscribers. Uh, and as a subscriber, we can uh, configure it Lambda function, HTTP endpoint, uh, Kinesis service, uh, SQS. All those subscribers uh, can receive uh, such message. Um, we need to uh, understand uh, synchronous and asynchronous behavior. Uh, in AWS. Um, for instance, uh, every time when you uh, create a uh, resource inside AWS, like create S3 bucket or DynamoDB table, um, it is example of uh, asynchronous operation. So it's enough, uh, it's not enough just to generate such API call uh, and immediately after that uh, you know, use uh, this uh, bucket or this dynamic table, table. We have to make sure that resource is ready. Uh, we need to uh, get status of this resource and uh, when, it's, when this resource is active, now everything is ready to start using it. So uh, we can implement uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, approach in the uh, step function. Uh, if, you are, if you are using REST APIs, for example, typically a uh, REST API based on Amazon API Gateway, uh, it's an example of synchronous um, operation. So when your client side on front end generates request uh, and forward this request to the API Gateway, uh, to your REST API, uh, now the application is waiting for the response. Uh, so uh, what if uh, we... We don't have any responses. So you should handle exception uh, exceptions inside your application code. And we need to understand that basically um, in AWS, uh, all those exceptions uh, can be split into two uh, large categories, 400 ex exceptions, 500 exceptions. When we talk about 400 exceptions, uh, something's wrong probably uh, with your application or maybe with your request or with the shape of this request, and uh, uh, we need to fix that. What if we are receiving five, 500 exceptions from the cloud? It means that the problem on the cloud side. Uh, and in, in such situation, we have to just repeat request after uh, some timeout. Uh, but uh, uh, the tricky part is uh, how can we manage this timeout? Uh, and you can implement another pattern, uh, exponential backoff uh, inside your application to make sure that the first repeat, you know, will be generated in a few milliseconds, the next one after seconds, the next one after three seconds. So to avoid um, overloading uh, of your application or different services. Another aspect that you see uh, on the screen and you you have to understand how to implement that in your code, uh, stateful and stateless design. And uh, typically the stateless design allows you to uh, scale uh, different parts of your application, especially compute uh, resources uh, independently. 
Um, the example of uh, stateful implementation is a lambda-based solution because each lambda function uh, considered uh, as a stateless code. Uh, we uh, externalize uh, the state for the lambda function uh, and despite the fact that technically you can store some information inside lambda, uh, we strongly do not recommend to do so because the uh, runtime where lambda code will be executed will be destroyed uh, after some period of time when uh, your lambda function execution has been finished. Uh, the same thing we can uh, we can say about Docker containers. Another example of uh, typically stateless solution. So each container uh, should be uh, designed as a stateless code. Uh, and again, if you need to keep your state somehow, use uh, any external services like uh, services provided by AWS or in some cases we can mount uh, EFS, Elastic File System, to the container. Now you see uh, on the screen a couple of services that uh, you have to know in depth uh, when you will go to this exam. Uh, SDK. Uh, uh, what do I mean by uh, depth knowledge of SDK? You will not be checked um, against specific programming language in this exam. No. Uh, it's not a focus of the exam. However, uh, we need to understand that in SDK uh, or the leveraging SDK is the uh, way to improve your productivity because every uh, each uh, API call to AWS must have a digital signature. And in order to generate the signature, you should use access key. So SDK typically uh, managed all those stuff related to um, calculating and generating the signature for you. But not only. Uh, if you're leveraging SDK, uh, each SDK can be configured to um, implement retry attempts. Again, in case of 500 exception, for instance, SDK automatically can repeat um, your API calls to the cloud and uh, you can adjust uh, the number of retries in SDK configurations and also timeout between them. So you can enable uh, exponential back off right here. What else? In SDK, you can use uh, different uh, uh, abstractions like uh, waiters uh, back to um, synchronous asynchronous operations. Uh, when you generate requests to create DynamoDB table, uh, now you can create a waiter and this waiter uh, returns the handling to you only when a table is absolutely ready and active and now you can start using it. Paging, another aspect. So uh, if we need to retrieve information from a database or maybe uh, if we need to uh, list all files stored in specific S3 bucket. And now let's imagine that we have thousands of files there. S3 uh, cannot return to you uh, the full list of a uh, couple of thousand files in one response which means that uh, we can receive just a portion of this information and have to uh, request a new page, a new portion, a new portion. And again, SDK can help you to do so. So uh, we need to understand that. Uh, what else? SAM, serverless application model. This is framework and uh, also CLI that you can download and install in your machine. Uh, and probably you'll see um, several questions related to the SAM because it's very popular tool to design a serverless based application. And uh, in by leveraging SAM, uh, we can uh, manage the entire life cycle. So you can create project, uh, you can build project, you can uh, create package uh, for your Lambda, for instance, and you can deploy uh, your application in the cloud. You need to understand uh, API gateway. Again, it's very often uh, this service uh, can be mentioned uh, in exam questions very often. So uh, what kind of APIs uh, you can create in uh, this service? So HTTP API, REST API, uh, WebSockets API. And as a fourth um, type, uh, we can talk about private API. That's another important thing because uh, in some cases we have to design application that will be accessible only from the specific virtual private cloud, not by uh, anyone from the internet. And Kinesis, again, um, some questions, maybe 
may be focused on uh, Kinesis family. Uh, at least on a high level, you need to understand uh, what services we have in the Kinesis family. Uh, what uh, What's the difference between um, Kinesis uh, data streams, Kinesis firehose, uh, how can we use uh, Kinesis uh, data analytics? Right, moving forward, um, how can we uh, build our solution? Well, one of the main tool here, uh, especially when we talk about exam, uh, is a code build. That's the uh, one of the service from the code family. Uh, and you can configure a code build appropriately uh, by preparing um, build spec.yaml file. Inside this YAML file, you can describe uh, all steps, all stages um, that uh, needs to be completed in order to build your solution. In such YAML file, you can specify that you need to download uh, appropriate version of you know, .NET Core, for example. After that, you need to set up some environment variables, uh, do compilation, uh, package uh, the result as a zip file, push it to the S3, something like that. And later on, we'll talk a little bit about CICD, and you will see that code build is one of the part of uh, continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment uh, pipeline. Uh, Sam, you see here uh, this tool once again, because again, inside this tool, uh, we can uh, manage all steps um, in a software development life, life cycle. Uh, you can uh, build your application, you can test your serverless based application and by the way you can test such applications locally so lambda for example can be tested locally before you will submit it uh, to the cloud and after that you can deploy or just package your uh, code and push it to the code repository to trigger uh, CICD. Uh, cloud formation uh, can help you uh, to prepare required infrastructure um, for the application. Uh, we've already talked about uh, API Gateway because especially uh, when you see uh, SAM uh, in the exam question, uh, very often uh, SAM uh, is being used to, de to develop application based on Lambda and API Gateway. And this uh, collaboration uh, or this integration between API Gateway and uh, uh, Lambda service is very important. So the fact that we can generate API request uh, to uh, API Gateway and backend can be implemented as a set of Lambda function, uh, that's very commonly used button in the real life uh, and uh, in exam, uh, of course. And DynamoDB, another uh, very popular uh, solution uh, that typically uh, can be used within the same project because uh, serverless application model provides you with simplified uh, version of cloud formation template to really um, you know to simplify uh, white white the description of serverless resources that needs to be uh, deployed and Cognito, we'll talk about Cognito service uh, a bit later on uh, in the security stuff. Uh, that's how we can uh, realize uh, authentication and authorization processes within our application. Now, uh, let's talk in a bit more details about Lambda. Again, uh, Lambda is important focus uh, of uh, updated version of uh, developer associate exam. And uh, you, when you design your application uh, based on Lambda functions, um, we can address um, some uh, design principles and recommendations from uh, operation excellence uh, pillar from well architected framework and reliability. Because uh, uh, Lambda service is a great example of serverless solution, uh, provides you with built-in uh, scalability, uh, fault tolerance, and high availability. So um, let's uh, let's talk about uh, um, the main uh, aspects of using Lambda. So first of all, uh, we can talk about uh, two main um, things here: uh, Lambda service itself and Lambda function. Lambda service that AWS service uh, which uh, manages your Lambda function. Lambda function is your code that you should write, uh, package uh, appropriately, and submit to the cloud. Lambda as a service uh, support many different runtime. Uh, you see not a full list uh, on the screen. Um, Python, Java, Node.js, uh, I can add uh, uh, um, C-sharp or uh, .NET co uh, 
.NET, we can add uh, Go language, uh, and it would be nice if you remember all supported uh, runtimes uh, by Lambda. So uh, Lambda uh, implements required invocation model because depending on the service that you will configure it as a trigger for your Lambda function, um, we can talk about three different invocations models for your Lambda function. Uh, synchronous, for instance, uh, when we have incoming request to the API gateway, API gateway invokes your Lambda function uh, and wait for response from the Lambda. Asynchronous, uh, when we um, upload file uh, to the S3 bucket, for example, uh, and S3 sends notifications to the Lambda. And Lambda service, in this case, invokes uh, your Lambda function. Um, well, uh, during this invocation model, uh, probably you know that, uh, the uh, original message from the S3 uh, will be put by Lambda service into the internal queue. You don't have to create it. It will be supported by the Lambda. And as a separate uh, call invokes your uh, Lambda function and submit this message uh, as an input parameter. And now um, when your Lambda function uh, has finished, uh, you can set up destination. Uh, destination in case of uh, successful Lambda execution, destination in case of uh, your Lambda function failed, or both. It's up to you. So uh, what we can talk about Lambda function itself? Uh, you need to understand uh, the limitations and quotas uh, for the Lambda, and you see here uh, the most uh, important uh, limitation, 15 minutes uh, maximum execution time. Uh, if you need to um, implement some logic uh, that exceeds uh, this limitation, maybe Lambda is not a suitable solution for you. Or maybe uh, you should use something uh, uh, in addition like uh, step functions to orchestrate um, sequentially invoked Lambda function uh, within your application. That's possible as well. Uh, so what we need to uh, configure for uh, Lambda function. So first of all, triggers. Uh, based on what events uh, your Lambda function can be, uh, can be uh, or must be invoked. Uh, again, depending on the trigger, uh, the invocation model can be different. And uh, I've already talked about uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, invocation model. Uh, the third and the last one, and the last one is uh, pool model. For streaming services like Kinesis or uh, DynamoDB, because we can enable uh, streams for DynamoDB. Uh, Lambda service, not your Lambda code. Lambda service periodically checks what's going on in the stream, uh, and if we have uh, new messages, uh, those messages uh, will be taken from the stream and uh, put as an input, uh, sent as an input parameter to your Lambda function. And again, uh, first of all, this information will be uh, stored in the internal queue, and after that, uh, your Lambda code will be executed. Why it's important? Because in the application, well, in the Lambda configuration, you can say how many messages uh, needs to be read from the stream. Or let's say, um, should Lambda service uh, put message immediately when it appear in the stream, or uh, we can enable kind of batching, uh, waiting until 10 messages uh, here in the stream and after that uh, we can uh, send them to the Lambda. So what else? We can uh, enable environment variables. That's a great way to adjust Lambda behavior. Uh, for instance, Lambda uh, generates some uh, file and this file uh, needs to be stored in the S3 bucket. Using environment variables you can easily define the name of this bucket without changing uh, Lambda code every time you have to change this target. Uh, I've already mentioned stream uh, for Kinesis and DynamoDB, uh, Lambda service uh, read information from the stream and you can adjust uh, the, this behavior depending on the service. So check the uh, service documentation to understand uh, what, what options we have here. Uh, you need to, uh, to be able to handle errors. Uh, that's interesting part uh, for the Lambda because uh, uh, when you work with Lambda function, uh, the errors handling, um, you know, assumes two different parts. We can talk about uh, errors uh, in Lambda invocation. 
uh, when uh, your Lambda functions cannot be invoked for some reasons. Maybe you don't have enough permissions. Maybe uh, you uh, generated incorrect payload, uh, which exceed the maximum size, and so on and so forth. Um, maybe you exceed some uh, limits, right? In such cases, Lambda service responds to you with 400 um, uh, error exception, you should handle that in your application code. But what if uh, the problem uh, is not with invocation, the problem in the code? So the Lambda function uh, itself failed by doing something. Well, uh, any errors generated by uh, Lambda code uh, will be returned to you as a uh, header uh, in the response from Lambda service. Again, you need to understand uh, what header you need to check. Uh, in the application code to uh, understand the root of issues, to understand the error itself. Uh, we can talk about integration with many different services. Uh, Lambda currently supports a huge list of services that uh, you can uh, use together with Lambda functions. Uh, don't forget about uh, permissions, I would say about uh, security model. Because uh, uh, when you configure your Lambda, uh, we can talk about two types of permissions. The first one, who is able to invoke your Lambda function? For instance, uh, in API gateway configuration, you should create, sorry, when you configure uh, your Lambda function being invoked by API gateway, uh, you should create a resource-based policy. And inside this resource-based policy, you, you should say that I'm allowing uh, API gateway to invoke my Lambda. The second uh, set of permissions, uh, execution permissions, what exactly your Lambda code can do when it will be invoked. Uh, and if your Lambda function should read something from DynamoDB, uh, you should create IAM role and attach it to your Lambda function. And for this IAM role, you should define policy saying that uh, you are allowing uh, to work with uh, uh, appropriate DynamoDB tables or maybe with all uh, dynamic tables. And um, finally, uh, you need to understand how we can tune uh, our functions. Um, you see a couple of uh, aspects uh, in such tuning. So uh, memory, um, memory optimization. For the Lambda function, as you remember probably, uh, you cannot uh, set up such parameter uh, like v, um, virtual CPU cores. No. The only um, parameter that we can set up uh, from the infrastructure perspective, the memory, how much memory we can allocate. And remember, the more memory you will allocate, the more uh, compute capacity, CPU capacities will be allocated by AWS service for your Lambda function as well. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the more this Lambda uh, will cost for you. Uh, initialization uh, process. Um, if we have the first event, uh, the first trigger, uh, Lambda service prepares runtime environment. You can consider this runtime environment as a kind of uh, container, not a Docker container, like a logical container. And inside this container, environment will be prepared. Uh, the code of your Lambda function will be downloaded. Uh, any layers, if you configure them uh, for the Lambda will be downloaded. Uh, some additional uh, initialization steps uh, will be completed here and it takes some time. And that's why uh, we can talk about uh, cold, um, cold time or cold execution. Um, that's kind of preparation step can, is, can uh, you know, take, you know, hundreds of milliseconds, more than one second in some cases. And only after that, uh, your code will be executed. How can we uh, manage that? You can configure a provision concurrency. Because in this case, let's say uh, I've configured provision concurrency equal to 10. In this case, 10 runtime environments will be prepared and performed in advance by Lambda service. And every time when we have incoming event, uh, now we don't have to uh, create those runtimes. They're already ready and your Lambda code can be executed immediately. Uh, but at the same time, that's the, um, this, this setting increases the cost of your solution. And it's always balanced that you need to find between the cost optimization and the performance. Uh, 
So uh, in the exam, uh, read carefully a uh, question because um, in the question, typically you can find the keywords that identify the main goal. So uh, we need to minimize time or uh, we need to uh, optimize cost. So based on that, uh, you can make decision uh, which answer is the more appropriate. So what else? Um, we can um, optimize the uh, Lambda execution. We can optimize our architecture uh, by integrating Lambda with different services. And very often uh, having Lambda instead of different compute resources uh, can uh, optimize uh, your architecture from the performance perspective, from the availability perspective, from the cost perspective. So by replacing EC2 instances, for example, uh, and implement your backend based on the Lambda, we can achieve uh, this uh, goal. So what about filtering? Um, this is amount of information that Lambda uh, function uh, should process. So uh, for example, uh, if we have S3 bucket as a trigger, uh, to invoke a Lambda function. Uh, in the uh, trigger configuration, uh, you can say that uh, Lambda should be invoked every time uh, when you file uh, appeared in this bucket, but, and after that as a filter, you can specify a prefix. Uh, so the Lambda should be invoked only if a specific prefix uh, for this object uh, specify or uh, set up, right? So uh, again, uh, if it's uh, suitable for the logic of your application, use it because that's the way to uh, reduce amount of information or number of invocations of your Lambda function. Moving forward, um, data uh, storage option, let's say this way. Uh, it's very important. Uh, it's very important to understand uh, what uh, storage options uh, you can use in AWS. And I'm talking here not just about general storage like S3 or uh, EFS. Uh, I'm talking here about databases as well. So uh, we need to understand, at least at high level, that in AWS we can create a block storage, and the typical example here is EBS volume. Uh, we can create file storage. Uh, EFS, uh, Amazon FS6, those are examples of the services that uh, allows you to um, create a, a file system in the cloud and mount it uh, to your applications, to different EC2 instances, for example. And finally, uh, the third part is uh, object storage, uh, an S3. Uh, is a great example here. Uh, why it's important? Because the behavior of those uh, storage options um, is different. Uh, in S3, as you remember, in order to change uh, something inside the file stored in S3 bucket, uh, you should take this file, entire file, download it, do some changes, and put it back to the bucket. Or maybe you've already, uh, you already have the copy of this file. But again, uh, you should do some changes there inside your application and put this object entirely to the S3. You cannot change one byte inside the, um, inside the file stored in S3 bucket without taking it or without replacing it, right? So we need to take that into account and it means uh, in particular that uh, S3 is a great solution uh, when we need to uh, place information in S3 and read this information intensively. But when you see the pattern where uh, the information uh, needs to be changed very often by many different uh, applications or virtual machines or uh, by different teams, the S3 uh, might be not ideal solution here. Uh, we need to understand a uh, consistency model uh, depending on the services. Uh, so uh, in DynamoDB, which is a great example uh, of database option and serverless uh, service in AWS, um, in DynamoDB, uh, every time when you're trying to read something from DynamoDB, you can choose between two consistent model, uh, eventual consistent model or strong consistent model. An eventual consistency model will be used by default. Uh, but we can change that, again, for each read operation. So why it's important? That's how we can uh, manage or solve the problem read after write. If you uh, change something 
uh, recently in DynamoDB table. And immediately after that, you're going to read this information uh, by your application. Uh, in eventual consistent model, potentially you can get uh, not updated information. But at the same time, uh, eventual consistent model reduce uh, response time. And uh, that's the way to improve performance. So uh, you have to understand uh, your business requirements and choose the most appropriate model here. Moreover, moreover specifically for DynamoDB, uh, you need to understand uh, performance settings. Uh, for each table, uh, you can set up number of RCU, read capacity units, and WCU right capacity units and you see the definition uh, on the slide right now uh, and here is example and uh, you can be asked during the exam uh, to do some calculation and choose the most appropriate answer based on the result of your calculation so you see here example uh, we have DynamoDB table um, in provisioned capacity mode and uh, 10 read capacity units was set up uh, as a performance limit uh, the size of the item uh, in DynamoDB table is uh, 4 kilobyte. Now the question is, uh, how many uh, information we can read from this table per second? Uh, and the answer depends on a consistent model. Because a strong consistent model consume uh, one uh, 4 kilobyte page per second. And because we have 10, such capacity units so per second uh, we can uh, get uh, up to 10 um, or we can handle up to 10 requests right however uh, if you change the uh, consistent model for read operation to eventual uh, just half of capacity unit consumed uh, by such read operation and as a result uh, using the same limit uh, we can uh, generate uh, 20 requests Per second. So keep that in mind uh, when you will see a question uh, with some DynamoDB calculation. All right, uh, moving forward, uh, it's important to understand that uh, depending on the service, uh, we can deal with uh, temporary or ephemeral storage. One of the example here is EBS volume. Uh, not ABS. Uh, one of the examples here is EC2. When you provision EC2 instance, uh, you can organize virtual hard drives for this EC2 based on EBS, which is persistent storage, or based on instant store option, which is ephemeral. And this information will be destroyed every time when you stop uh, this EC2 instance. Uh, another example of ephemeral um, storage, uh, Docker container. Um, all information that uh, you store inside container is ephemeral because if this container uh, will be terminated, uh, uh, you will lose uh, this information. Uh, doesn't mean that uh, ephemeral storage is always uh, not a good uh, solution. No. Uh, for such a scenario like ETL, extract, transform, load, uh, we can provision uh, EMR cluster, for example, and we can use uh, instant store uh, as a virtual hard drive uh, for nodes inside this cluster because uh, instant store provides you with huge amount of uh, input output operations uh, and because uh, we are building this cluster in order to get some information put it inside the cluster do some uh, transformation produce results and push it back to the s3 for instance ephemeral is a great option because the cluster itself we can consider as a, a temporary resource uh, throughput, uh, we need to understand that as well. Uh, remember that for the S3, we have some limit uh, for uh, write-read operations. Uh, and uh, uh, you can extend this limit uh, if you organize your files inside S3 bucket with appropriate prefixes, because the limit is calculated based on prefix in S3. Um, of course, uh, frequency of access and updates, you've already seen an example on the previous slide, uh, how can we calculate um, RCU, WCU for DynamoDB, and that's how we can manage the performance of the table based on uh, demand uh, to our uh, application. Um, availability and durability, in S3 for instance, uh, you can choose different uh, storage classes, uh, and uh, well, they uh, impact um, availability, 
like one zone storage class doesn't provide you with the same level of availability like standard uh, storage class um, and um, we can talk about uh, time to retrieve uh, information from the service in this case uh, very often uh, we can manage and we have to enable uh, such feature uh, within our architecture so lifecycle management uh, that's the uh, set of rules uh, you can set up for the S3 bucket. Uh, and uh, uh, that's the way to move information between different storage classes uh, based on such rules. And uh, it's the way to optimize cost of your solution. Finally, we can talk about integrity, uh, confidentiality, and availability. And we will talk about this topic uh, in a more details in uh, one of the following section, section in the security. So what else? Uh, we need to discuss uh, talking about uh, um, data, caching. That's important. Uh, for databases, uh, we can use uh, different caching solution. Uh, don't forget about Elastic Cache. That's the more generic uh, caching solution and you can use uh, Elastic Cache um, for almost any uh, databases that you can provision inside the AWS cloud environment. Or another example, DAX, DynamoDB Accelerate. This service was designed specifically for DynamoDB and it's compatible uh, with uh, Dynamo API. That's why when you will set up DAX uh, between your application code and DynamoDB table, uh, you can reduce latency uh, up to microseconds, uh, but uh, you don't have to uh, significantly change your application. In reality, the, um, the only thing that you need to change here the endpoint, because now your application should uh, talk to the endpoint of the DAX, not DynamoDB. Every time when you need to do something with the data, put item, read item, uh, scan, DynamoDB table, etc. So design. Uh, another interesting aspect of um, data uh, storage or database implementation uh, for DynamoDB especially. Um, so uh, double check that you understand um, different indexes, uh, secondary indexes that you can create for DynamoDB table, um, that, that you understand the difference between uh, local secondary index and global secondary index. The first one uh, is uh, less flexible. You should create LSI during the table creation and you cannot do it later on. You cannot delete uh, LSI uh, later on. Uh, however, LSI supports both uh, eventual and uh, strong consistency models. GSI, another story, it's quite flexible. You can add it at any time. You can uh, remove it at any time. In GSI, uh, you can use a uh, primary key based on any attributes from your table. Uh, however, it supports eventual consistent to read model only. Finally, uh, scans and queries. Uh, every time uh, when you need to retrieve some uh, data set from the table, uh, try to use uh, more fine-tuned uh, query, I mean, uh, to avoid the full scan of your database uh, or for uh, your DynamoDB table. Because, uh, first of all, uh, it delays uh, response. Uh, secondly, uh, it consume a lot of capacity units, and as a result, it, it increases uh, your cost. Okay, so uh, keeping that in mind, uh, let's uh, analyze two uh, question examples uh, in this section and after that we'll have uh, the first uh, short break. Um, let's start with uh, uh, develop code for application hosted section and here is example. Uh, let's read through uh, this, um, this question and uh, this case study. Uh, a commerce application is storing uh, shopping statistic in Amazon DynamoDB table. And the developer is re, uh, writing a, a resilient backend service uh, to retrieve shopping statistics to calculate uh, sums and averages. Statistics needs to be calculated in near real time. What should developer do to meet uh, requirements? Uh, every time when you see an uh, exam question, try to identify the keywords in these questions to be focused on uh, the right answers later on. And um, here, here you see the keywords uh, in this specific question. Uh, we are talking about some uh, shopping statistics, 
uh, DynamoDB uh, is a concern uh, in this uh, in this question, this operation. Uh, we are talking about some calculation, and we have to do that in a, a near real time. Now uh, let's go uh, and uh, um, read um, proposed answers, and you have to choose just one from this list. I give you a minute to. Uh, analyze all options and after that we will discuss them together. And you can type for example in the questions uh, the options you would choose in this case if you want. All right uh, so what options we have? Uh, AWS batch to schedule job that will calculate sum and average. Well, I didn't. Uh, I don't think so. Why? Because of uh, real time. Typically, batch can be scheduled, uh, and uh, um, it assumes that we have some delay before uh, the next job will be executed. Uh, B. Connect lambda function to DynamoDB streams to calculate uh, sums and average. It's a very well-known pattern, and uh, I would uh, say that uh, it's a great candidate to be uh, a right answer. Uh, but please uh, read carefully all answers all the time during the real exam. Um, I've seen the situation many times um, when I work as a trainer, uh, previously uh, external trainer, that uh, the people uh, reading answer uh, said, Oh, that's the right. Uh, that's the right answer. Boom. Uh, and later on, probably you can see that uh, another option is uh, even better. But uh, um, you you didn't spend time to uh, uh, read this uh, answer carefully and choose choose it. Uh, all right. C. Uh, event bridge. Uh, event bridge. Event. Uh, well. We can use event bridge in many architecture, but uh, uh, event bridge as a service itself um, doesn't calculate anything. So we can invoke something uh, to do calculation based on event bridge rule. So probably it's not a, a good candidate here. And finally, connect single EC2 instance to DynamoDB streams to calculate sums and average. Well, technically it's possible. That's the solution. However, um, first of all, uh, we see uh, just a single EC2 instance. Uh, probably it's not resilient backend in this case, as you can guess. And moreover, uh, Lambda is more is a better choice uh, in this case because you don't have to provision any infrastructure and resources. And that's why uh, the correct answer here is B. All right, so, um, moving forward. Um, the uh, next and the last question in this section. Uh, it's focused on Lambda. All right, um, here we are. A uh, company is migrating uh, create, read, update, delete functionality, craft functionality of existing Lambda, uh, of the existing Java uh, web application uh, to AWS Lambda. So we are going to migrate Java code uh, and use it as a Lambda function. Uh, which minimal code refactoring is necessary uh, for CRUD operations to run a uh, Lambda function, right? So again, uh, keywords here. First of all, uh, we are talking about existing Java application, uh, Java, right? Uh, we are going to transform into the Lambda function and we need to minimize effort uh, in order to complete this task. Again, uh, four different answers here, you have to choose just one. What do you think here? All right. Uh, let's uh, let's do it together. Uh, a implement lambda handler uh, function. Sounds reasonable, because uh, you must define handler uh, for the lambda, and maybe that's the uh, refactoring uh, we have to do in our case. Okay, um, it seems like a good candidate. Uh, B uh, import uh, X-ray package. Well, X-ray can help you to trace. Uh, your application, uh, but uh, uh, first of all, it's uh, optional uh, service. Um, finally, um, it doesn't help you to uh, implement your Lambda, right? Uh, 
uh, we can consider it as, uh, as a destructor uh, in this list. C, rewrite application code in Python. Well, you can do that if you want, especially if you're a fan of the Python bit. Um, we are talking about uh, minimal code refactoring. And uh, uh, if you remember, Java is officially supported runtime uh, for the Lambda. All right. Finally, uh, add reference to the Lambda execution role. Role can be used to set up security context. Uh, for a Lambda function, uh, it uh, uh, can help you to uh, move Java application and use it as a Lambda. So with that, uh, that's the uh, right answer. Okay, so uh, so by leveraging this um, logic, now you can uh, choose the most appropriate answer uh, for a question like this one uh, and uh, move to the next part in the exam. All right, uh, with that, uh, let's pause here a little bit. I will set up timer for the next 10 minutes uh, to have a short break, uh, and after that, we'll start talking about uh, security. So uh, let me open timer on the screen. Uh, so at any time, you can uh, check how much time left before uh, we'll continue. And let's have a break. Talk to you soon. Thanks.
All right, everyone, uh, let's move on. Uh, the second domain in this exam is quite interesting and uh, uh, complicated at the same time. Uh, we're going to talk about security uh, a little bit. Uh, within security domain, uh, we have three main tasks according to exam guide. Uh, so we need to understand how to implement uh, authentication and authorization. Uh, and that's true for both uh, authentication and authorization within your AWS account or within your application. Uh, we need to understand how can we implement encryption by using different AWS services, and it's especially important for such services like DynamoDB, uh, RDS S3, especially S3, and finally, how to manage sensitive data uh, in application code. So uh, let's talk about each of those tasks in the first one, uh, authentication and authorization processes. As you know, uh, in AWS account, uh, all authentication and authorization processes can be managed by IAM, Identity and Access Management Service. So that's how uh, in uh, account we can create uh, users, groups, or roles. Uh, those are actors who can do something and we can create policies uh, to set up set of permissions for the users, groups, and roles. Uh, but we can do that inside one uh, AWS account. Uh, if you deal with a multi-account environment, probably that will be uh, not a focus in a developer associate exam, but still you need to understand that. Uh, we can manage multi-account uh, environment based on uh, AWS organization service. So uh, in Deb, AWS organization service, you can create uh, service control policies, as you can see on the slide right now. And such uh, SCP uh, policy can be attached to uh, entire organization or a specific organizational unit, and uh, uh, it will affect all accounts within this organizational unit. Or uh, you can attach a service control policy to specific AWS account. Uh, but keep in mind that uh, using uh, policies uh, inside your uh, account, identity-based policy, or using policies that uh, attach to the resources. Not all services support resource-based policies, but some of them uh, do, uh, like S3. So those policies uh, can help you to set up permissions and uh, grant or uh, revoke uh, some, uh, some rights, some permissions. But the service control policy uh, can be used not to grant permissions to the account, uh, but to filter. It's important to understand that. Uh, because in the service control policies, typically you will use explicit deny, saying that I'm denying uh, using of EC2 service. And now the service control policy can be attached to organizational unit. And in all accounts within this organizational unit now, uh, you will be prohibited to use uh, EC2. That's the filter, uh, very hard filter that we can set up. Okay, so what about uh, uh, troubleshooting? Uh, if we have a lot of different users, groups, roles, if we have uh, service control policies, one of the great tools that you can use to uh, troubleshoot uh, any issues with permissions is policy simulator, right? Uh, if I open uh, the management console uh, and open IAM, uh, in my demo account, um, on the dashboard, the start page of IAM, just a second, uh, here we are. Uh, on the right-hand side, if I scroll down, uh, you, you see this link. So play with policy emulator, uh, emulator uh, a little bit, uh, because that's where uh, you can choose um, identity, user groups, roles. Uh, you can uh, choose the appropriate service. You're going to simulate permissions um, to, uh, and when you click run, uh, you will see the list of uh, final uh, effective permissions, uh, deny or allow uh, for specific services. Great tool that uh, can be mentioned uh, in exam questions. All right, uh, moving forward. Um, access. So, um, in uh, um, Identity-based or resource-based policy, uh, you can implement a, a role-based access control, saying that this person, this service, this application um, is able or is not able uh, to do something with uh, 
specific service or resource. You can see here also um, quite new feature, uh, attribute-based access control. Um, that's the way to set permissions based on some attributes, like tags, for instance. Uh, this model is implemented in um, some AWS services like Data Lake, for example. In a data lake, uh, we can uh, apply some permissions based on text. We can tag uh, different resources appropriately and use uh, this approach. However, uh, it worth to mention here that even in uh, standard identity-based policy, we can use tags as a conditions, saying that uh, uh, you're able to run your EC2 instances or you're able to change the configuration for EBS volume, but only if those resources have appropriate text. That's possible as well. You need to understand how to manage uh, permissions uh, for different services. Uh, S3 uh, is one of the important services that definitely it will be mentioned in the uh, exam questions. Uh, so please make sure that you understand access control um, mechanism for the S3. And for the S3 bucket, as you remember, we can use four uh, different mechanisms to control access, uh, identity-based policies, resource-based policies, and also legacy uh, approaches, uh, access control list, object control access control list, or bucket access control list. Uh, try do not use access control list in your real applications. Uh, focused on uh, policies. It's recommended way. Now you also see um, AWS directory service. Uh, you can see uh, some questions uh, related to uh, integration or interaction with uh, uh, Microsoft Active Directory. So we need to understand, uh, uh, at least at a high level, uh, what we can do with uh, AWS directory service. Uh, three main options are available for you uh, in this service. We can create a simple AD. By the way, uh, this type of uh, directory uh, is available uh, not across all regions, so we, you, you have to check that. Uh, but that's the way to implement, uh, you know, Samba compatible uh, directory. Uh, for uh, Typically for small uh, application with, um, you know, up to 500 uh, users, something like that. Maybe even more, but uh, again, it's... Uh, not for the large uh, enterprises. Um, AD connector, that's the way to um, proxy and redirect any authentication request from the application uh, that are based in AWS cloud to a corporate network. So if you have already uh, Microsoft Active Directory on a corporate network, now connector uh, will redirect any authentication request to uh, your locally hosted domain controllers. Um, it's a it's a way to uh, establish kind of uh, hybrid environment, but uh, a connector uh, can be a bottleneck because uh, the more and more application we have, the more and more traffic uh, needs to be redirected uh, using this connector. And again, uh, keeping in mind the bandwidth between uh, your corporate network and AWS, that might be the problem. Uh, the third option here, managed Microsoft AD. And in this case, the full... Um, Active Directory catalog, Active Directory environment uh, will be provisioned uh, in your AWS account. Uh, and that's how we can set up the different forest uh, and establish relationship between your uh, local Active Directory and cloud-based. It's a managed solution because the cloud-based domain controllers uh, will be provisioned uh, for you automatically and will be maintained. Uh, by AWS, so uh, we will do for you automatically snapshots. Uh, we can add additional domain controllers upon your request, etc. Moving forward, we need to understand uh, federated identity, uh, which is again uh, quite often um, requirements uh, for many applications. Um, if you need to uh, enable uh, cross-account access. Typically, you will do that uh, by assuming some role. In order to get access to the resources located in different AWS account, uh, in this account, uh, IAM role should be created. And in the role configuration, uh, the administrator should uh, say that this role can be assumed uh, by uh, users or applications from different accounts. 
And that's the way to uh, get temporary credentials and uh, work with resources in another account. Um, if you need to uh, enable a single sign-on experience um, for uh, Active Directory users, for instance, uh, we can establish uh, trust between cloud and Microsoft Active Directory and typically the authentication will be based on uh, SAML 2.0 uh, protocol here. And many uh, enterprise-based uh, identity system uh, use uh, this protocol, this specification. Web Identity Federation uh, typically will be used when we need to uh, enable for our applications the ability to log in based on um, social accounts like a Facebook or by leveraging uh, Amazon uh, consumer accounts, something like that. So please make sure that you understand uh, those mechanisms. So finally, um, you, have, um, you have to have the clear understanding of the authentication and authorization flow. Uh, for instance, uh, what's going on when uh, your application code assumes I am role? So uh, in reality, the call uh, will be uh, sent to AWS and this call will be managed by STS, Security Token Service. If everything is fine, you have permissions to assume this role, STS generates uh, temporary credentials. And this temporary credentials uh, is basically data structure where you can find uh, access key ID, secret access key, expiration time because it's a temporary credentials and uh, uh, typically uh, this expiration time is one hour, but you can change it. And finally, token, session token. Now having this information, uh, you can uh, use those uh, temporary credentials in order to interact with uh, appropriate service. Right? So, uh, and uh, leveraging roles, uh, it's a best way, it's a best practice uh, for your application. Instead of hard code, um, access key uh, in your application code or even uh, uh, instead of storing access key somewhere in the configuration files uh, inside virtual machine for instance, you can assume a role, get temporary credentials, use them to uh, complete required applications, uh, com complete required actions. Right? Uh, and it's important to understand Cognita. Uh, Cognita service can help you to enable authentication and authorization within your application. Uh, so, uh, it's important to understand the difference between those two services inside Cognito. So, the user pool uh, can be used to organize and store identity information. If uh, to start working with your application, uh, end user should create a profile um, and, uh, um, you know, create login and password uh, for itself, the user pool can help you to do so. Uh, inside user pools, you can create groups, not IAM groups, groups for your applications. And that's how we can uh, manage permissions uh, at scale uh, for different application consumers. So it's identity store. Uh, and in user pool, you can set up password policy. You can uh, easily use some requirements like the minimum password length, complexity of the password. All those uh, features, features are built in in the user pool. Identity pool, completely different story. So identity pool you will leverage if you need get to get temporary credentials to interact uh, from your application code with uh, AWS services. Uh, and as a result of uh, successful authentication, your user will get token from the um, user pool. And now this token can be exchanged to the uh, temporary credentials to work with AWS uh, by leveraging identity pool. So application uh, can submit token to the identity pool saying, please return me temporary credentials to work with uh, S3 or something else. Okay. Uh, and those two features, user pools and identity pools can be used independently. You're not required to use them both inside your application. Okay, so you need to understand that. Moving forward, uh, encryption is always uh, complex uh, and I would say boring stuff, but we have to understand that, especially uh, to build compliance solution uh, that uh, will be used in uh, some uh, restricted environment like healthcare or public sector or something like that. 
So what we need to understand about encryption. So first of all, uh, you can enable encryption at rest and in transit when you build your cloud-based solution. Uh, and we need to understand how can we generate and manage encryption keys. Also, it's important to understand the difference between server-side and client-side encryption options. And that's especially true uh, when we talk about uh, uh, S3. Make sure that you understand all encryption options for the S3 because you can, you can be asked uh, about that in the exam question. So here is a table that uh, where you see all um, you know four options uh, for the S3 to encrypt information stored in S3 bucket. Uh, those option two options can be split into two uh, main categories: client side encryption. Uh, that's the situation where uh, you encrypt file inside your application on your side. And only after that, in encrypted form, you will send it to the S3. And S3 will just place it in the bucket. That's it. So you are fully responsible for encryption, decryption, uh, and key management operations in this case. Uh, it's additional effort, but at the same time, uh, you have a full control under the key. Uh, and the second category is uh, uh, server-side encryption. Uh, when you send information to, uh, to the S3 in a clear uh, text uh, and uh, uh, your files will be encrypted automatically. Uh, but you see uh, three different options here. Uh, this one is quite interesting. Server-side encryption with customer-provided encryption key. Uh, the benefit of this option is again you have a full control under encryption key. And if you see uh, appropriate requirements and exam questions, that might be an option for you. However, uh, technically, it's additional effort from your side because every time when you need to put file to, to the S3 or read file from the S3, you must provide encryption key in the header uh, of the request. And as a result, as a result of course, uh, you must use HTTPS traffic only in this case to make sure that uh, this encryption key cannot be catched in the transit. Uh, Server-side encryption S3, uh, the most convenient option. Because in this case, vice versa, all encryption keys will be managed by S3 entirely on behalf of you. Finally, uh, server-side encryption KMS. In this case, uh, you will create key uh, using KMS service, key management service, and the S3 configuration you can set up and configure it, saying that all files here inside this bucket um, must be encrypted uh, by leveraging this key. Again, the benefit here, you have some control under the key because you can set up policy for this key, saying who is able, who is not able uh, to use this key for encryption, decryption operations, who is able to enable rotation uh, for this key, etc. So, uh, but it's not only about S3. Uh, so you need to understand uh, how you can enable encryption for EBS volumes uh, and for the RDS. Uh, databases as well. Uh, so the most uh, tricky part here, remember that uh, you have to enable encryption for EBS and for the RDS instance uh, in advance. You cannot enable such encryption when EBS volume has been already created or RDS. Now, uh, if you see the situation like this, you've already uh, have some database without encryption. And now you have to enable uh, encryption. The only way you can do that, you should create uh, another instance of the uh, database with encryption enabled for this instance and migrate your data. And the same situation for e EBS. So you can create another EBS uh, volume or uh, you can say, I'd like to copy my EBS, but you can enable encryption for the target. So the initial uh, EBS, is still unencrypted, but the copy now can be uh, protected. And in all those cases, uh, for the EBS and RDS, uh, for DynamoDB table as well, uh, so KMS can be used as an option. I mean that um, you can leverage some keys that you as a customer generated here inside the service. So we need to analyze um, the question uh, to understand um, 
is there some requirement uh, to control encryption key? And if it is, uh, we should have a look at KMS or uh, customer provided key, something like that. If that's not the case, okay, we can uh, we can use default encryption options. In KMS uh, specifically, uh, uh, we can deal with two types of keys, managed CMKs and um, AWS managed key and customer managed key. Uh, the first category, right, uh, entirely managed by AWS. You can see those keys in KMS uh, Management Console, for instance, but you cannot do something with those keys. Uh, you cannot disable it, you cannot uh, delete them, etc. But it's very convenient uh, if you don't have specific requirements. Uh, the second part, uh, customer managed keys. Those keys uh, can be created by you. And for each such key, uh, you can specify policy, saying who exactly uh, can use uh, this key. Uh, you can also enable rotation, another important requirement uh, that you can see in the exam question. Uh, in KMS, uh, this rotation can be just enabled uh, and uh, uh, you cannot set up uh, rotation period. It's built in. It's just one uh, year uh, for the KMS, at least currently. KMS is very convenient, uh, robust, um, multi-region solution. However, uh, we need to understand that KMS is multi-tenant service, which means that uh, the same KMS service and as a result, the same set of uh, hardware, security hardware models managed by KMS can be used to store uh, encryption keys from different customers. Those keys will be fully isolated. However, you can see uh, the requirement where uh, only you as a customer uh, should uh, um, create and manage your keys. Uh, and uh, you must use single tenant uh, environment. And that's where Cloud HSM service can be leveraged. Because based on this service, you can create cluster of uh, HSM models, this cluster will be managed by AWS and those uh, hardware models will be managed by AWS for you, but they will be exposed as a cluster within a uh, VPC that you can specify. And now uh, you can set up uh, applications, you can write application to uh, use HSM uh, API, uh, and now you can generate here uh, your keys, you can store uh, keys there, you can leverage them uh, for different uh, operations and, and so on. And this cluster belongs to you only. Finally, we can combine uh, KMS plus Cloud HSM. That's kind of advanced scenario, but it's possible. So uh, you can create the cluster like this one. Uh, and after that, in KMS configuration, you can say, I'd like to use custom store. And this custom store is nothing else like this cluster. And we can uh, use the benefits from both services. Very convenient uh, uh, KMS API, but at the same time, it will be single tenant environment in terms of uh, key generation and storage. And also um, keep in mind that, um, well, technically you can use KMS key directly to uh, encrypt and decrypt your data. Uh, but you are very limited here because the uh, maximum amount of data uh, you can, that you can encrypt this way is uh, 4 kilobyte. Um, in most cases, you will use uh, envelope uh, encryption when uh, the file, for instance, itself uh, will be encrypted by uh, some block symmetric key and after that key uh, will be protected by the KMS key. So the two-layer uh, hierarchy, uh, and this hierarchy uh, is being used in many uh, AWS services like in EBS, uh, in uh, RDS, in DynamoDB, maybe with some extensions. But uh, And you can use the same approach in your applications as well. Now, uh, uh, what about other secrets? Uh, what if we need to uh, store some secrets except Encryption, encryption keys. You see here two main options to do so. Uh, parameter store inside a, a systems manager service. 
parameter store can be considered as a, a database, key value database, and uh, that's where uh, we can store uh, many different parameters for our applications, databases, uh, for the cloud formation templates. Uh, and by the way, in the parameter store, you can uh, keep information in uh, clear text or uh, some of your parameters can be encrypted uh, by leveraging KMS key. That's the first option for you. And uh, if you are not using uh, extended parameters, uh, parameter store is for free. Uh, the secrets manager is another approach. Uh, it's a paid service um, and all information all parameters, uh, all uh, data that you will store inside Secrets Manager, uh, by definition, will be encrypted. There is no way to store here clear text, right? Um, but one of the main benefits of the Secrets Manager, it provides you with ability to automatically rotate secrets. And if you see this, uh, uh, the question uh, saying that uh, you have to implement uh, protection for connection string to database. Probably the secret manager will be one of the better option, one of the best option uh, to implement that because we can uh, uh, securely store connection string here uh, and we can automatically rotate following uh, security best practice this secret um, leveraging this feature of the Secrets Manager. For such services like RDS, uh, this uh, automated protection can be enabled easily without uh, additional effort from your side. Right? So we have those two options. Uh, moving forward, um, in order to enable encryption uh, in transit, uh, we have to use, uh, we have to establish uh, SSL or TLS connection uh, and such connection um, we need to protect uh, leveraging some certificates, uh, X509 uh, standards. So you can generate such certificate by leveraging uh, ACM, uh, AWS Certificate Manager. What we need to understand, uh, in ACM uh, you can use both public certificates and private certificates. To generate public certificates, which will be signed by uh, AWS, uh, Amazon, let's say, um, you don't have to do anything else. Just generate the certificate and use it. But when you need to generate private certificates uh, for your application or uh, for the infrastructure that you deploy inside AWS, uh, you have to uh, uh, create and configure it uh, private uh, CA, Certification Authority, uh, and uh, all public certificates uh, are available for free. Private C CA, it's a paid option, so you will be charged per month uh, for leveraging the CA. Uh, but now, let's say you have a, a PKI infrastructure uh, deployed for you in the cloud, and you can use this infrastructure to generate required numbers of private certificate to establish a uh, protected connection between different parts of your solution. So, um, you can be asked about uh, the most appropriate solution to uh, protect database credentials, uh, connection string, etc. And we've already discussed that uh, Secrets Manager uh, probably is uh, one of the recommended uh, options here. Uh, but also don't forget that to interact with uh, many different uh, uh, third-party solutions or between your options, uh, we have to use uh, some certificate to establish and support uh, SSL and TLS connection. Uh, all right, um, the last part, uh, the last task uh, in this security domain, uh, how can we manage uh, sensitive information? What kind of aspects we need to discuss there? Well, first of all, uh, we need to understand how can we uh, classify data uh, within our applications and across different AWS services because some information uh, can be stored in unencrypted uh, format. Uh, some information can be classified as PII, uh, personal identifiable information, and probably it must be encrypted to follow um, compliant requ uh, requirements. Uh, some information can be marked as financial and again uh, we need to make sure that this information uh, is isolated and some additional security controls uh, can be applied 
uh, to this data and so on and so forth. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some services that uh, we can leverage uh, here. And we've already touched some of them. Well, first of all, uh, to protect uh, such information, to protect our data, uh, we can use preventive and detective controls uh, using KWS services. Uh, when we talk about preventive controls, well, this is IAM, um, users, groups, roles, uh, and appropriate policies that we can set up to restrict access to specific set of um, data or services. Uh, and resource-based policy, of course, uh, can be used there. We can talk here about infrastructure security, like uh, uh, if your data uh, stored within RDS database, um, you can apply um, security groups and network access control list because the RDS instance is located within a specific subnet or set of subnets when we talk about uh, multi-AZ deployment. So leverage all those uh, things. Uh, and finally, we can talk about uh, data protection. So um, we've already discussed encryption at rest. That's one of the way to uh, enable additional protection um, for your data, but not a single. Uh, in S3, for instance, uh, you can also uh, enforce uh, the policy where uh, in order to delete uh, some files, uh, you have to provide uh, MFA, the, the second factor, right? So MFA for deletion, one of the uh, recommended uh, way uh, to enable additional protection for some sensitive information. The uh, cloud trail locks is example of such sensitive information uh, because it, it's it's very important and crucial information here and we need to make sure that only a uh, specific set of uh, applications or people are able to talk with this information uh, or to work with this information. Uh, detective controls, that's how we can potentially detect uh, some issue or we can consider some activities as issue. Uh, and uh, having this information, we can react somehow. Um, so um, a couple of services uh, can be used here. And uh, one of such services, Amazon Macy. Uh, Macy uh, as a service was designed uh, for the S3 uh, to analyze information that you store across different buckets and based on some machine learning algorithms, uh, Macy can detect and generate findings to you saying that I see inside uh, this S3 bucket uh, some data uh, that looks similar to PII, pay attention here. So Macy again, it's detective mechanism, it will not do anything proactive for you, but it can analyze information on a regular base and generate findings for you. And now having this information, uh, you can do some additional actions. And of course, you can automate that. Uh, we can intercept uh, events generated by Macy using event breach uh, and automatically invoked, for instance, Lambda function that will um, do something, uh, maybe uh, that can enable encryption for the bucket if uh, PII information uh, is detected inside. Uh, and also you see here SageMaker, um, um, the service that you can use to uh, design, develop, train uh, and deploy uh, different machine learning models. And such machine learning models can extend uh, data classification approach uh, inside your applications. Uh, in order to pass uh, sensitive information between different microservices, between different components uh, within your application or between different AWS services, again, uh, we can leverage um, such services like Parameter Store or Secrets Manager. Uh, and it's a very common approach uh, when we need to deploy uh, some infrastructure in the cloud based on cloud formation templates. Uh, and you should create a set of virtual machines that will be used as a front end uh, and uh, RDS instance where um, some data will be stored. Uh, instead of uh, hard code, uh, again, credentials, uh, connection string or some credentials for this RDS instance in your cloud formation template, that's the way to, to lose this information because if um, for some mistake this cloud formation and code repository will be exposed to the external world, now everyone can take this 
template uh, and see those credentials. Instead of doing so, uh, you can reference from the cloud formation template information from the parameter store uh, or uh, from the secrets match. Use this uh, best practice and uh, choose uh, appropriate answer if you see something uh, in the exam questions. A couple of additional uh, security strategy strategies that uh, we can use. So um, secure your credentials. In IAM you can set up password policy. Um, if you need to uh, generate access keys in IAM, um, remember that for each IAM user we can create up to two uh, access keys uh, and uh, um, that's the way to rotate them on a regular basis. IAM doesn't provide you with built-in mechanism to rotate um, to rotate access keys and a secrets manager again uh, can be used to automate that. Uh, secure root account. Uh, if you've just created a brand new AWS account, inside this account uh, you will have just one uh, user, root user, which is super privileged as you know. Uh, so please do not use uh, root user root user for day-by-day uh, -day activities and especially uh, do not use access key associated with root user inside your application. Because again, if for some reason this access key will be leaked, no attacker can do anything with your AWS account. Um, uh, tend to use IAM roles instead of uh, permanent access key. Uh, it's more protected approach. So assume role um, and uh, use temporary credentials. Uh, and remember that when you uh, run your application code inside uh, EC2 instance, uh, we can attach role to EC2 instance as uh, instance profile. Remember that. And in this case, role will be assumed by EC2 service. And the temporary credentials will be exposed inside your virtual machine. And any applications, code, uh, uh, scripts uh, running inside can uh, use those temporary credentials to interact with uh, different AWS services. And uh, try to uh, automate as much as possible. Um, in order to deploy uh, security infrastructure, in order to update your application, in order to response uh, to different security events. And uh, one of the examples uh, I've already mentioned in case of uh, Macy that uh, detects uh, some uh, sensitive information, we can automatically uh, invoke uh, Lambda or some scripts based on uh, event breach uh, as a service that can uh, catch any events from different AWS services. Right. With that, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, examples here. Uh, question number one, uh, which is related to authentication and authorization. Uh, a bit long. Uh, be ready uh, to see long questions uh, as well in, in the exam. So, uh, developer writes a session uh, management component for web application and newly written code uh, records web session information to DynamoDB table. Sounds good. Uh, the developer uh, verifies functionality of the code and store credentials on a laptop. Sounds not so uh, attractive. And developer uses uh, production Amazon, Mace, uh, Amazon machine image, AMI, sorry for that, to deploy a code to test EC2 instance. And after that test fails, DynamoDB returns an error with a 403 uh, status code. Uh, which solution will resolve this issue most securely? That's the key word here. Okay, again, uh, so we are talking about uh, some uh, application that uses the NMDB table. Um, in all What we have. Uh, and as a result, uh, when this application is running uh, uh, inside EC2 instance, uh, the application code uh, can't talk to the DynamoDB. Now you see a couple of potential uh, troubleshooting activities. 
uh, we have to choose one. I'd like to give you a minute to go through all those options. All right, uh, let's talk about each of them. Uh, a, uh, create new IAM role that has the policy permissions necessary to access um, DynamoDB table and attach role to test EC2 instance. Sounds great, and we've just talked about that. That's one of the approach to uh, use temporary credentials in the cloud. Uh, and that's how we can provide our application running inside EC2 with appropriate permissions. B, uh, create IAM user uh, that has appropriate policy permissions to access DynamoDB, uh, generate a, a secret key, uh, okay, access key for this user, uh, and run CLI uh, on the test EC2 instance to store uh, access key there. Uh, that's possible. Uh, it's not a uh, recommended way. Technically, you can do that, uh, but the option A uh, looks better, okay, in terms of security. Uh, C, uh, create IAM group uh, that has appropriate policy permissions to access DynamoDB table and add EC2 instance to the, to the new group. You cannot do that technically. So uh, we can add inside IAM group only IAM users. And finally, create... Uh, you should use uh, identity-based policy. So with that, uh, we can eliminate uh, those three options, and uh, option A is uh, the right one. And the second example, the second question uh, in this uh, section uh, regarding encryption. Quite short, as you can see. Uh, so the question is, uh, a company wants to store sensitive data in S3 and encrypt this data at rest. A uh, company must manage encryption keys uh, and use S3 to perform the encryption. Uh, which solution meets these requirements? So uh, what we need to, uh, where we need to pay attention here. Uh, so we are talking about S3. Uh, we are going to uh, enable encryption at rest. Uh, we must have uh, ability to manage encryption key, uh, and we are talking here about uh, server-side encryption, as you can see. Now, uh, keeping that in mind, uh, you see four different options. Again, let's uh, read through th those options to choose the most appropriate one. What do you think? So, uh, let's discuss that. Uh, option A, um, use option server-side encryption with customer-provided key uh, to configure default encryption. 